Good morning. So to introduce myself, my name is David Briggs and I'm President and New South Wales Divisional Chair of the Colour Society of Australia and a committee member of the ISCC AIC Colour Literacy Project and CIE Technical Committee 199. My publications include a chapter on colour spaces in the Routledge Handbook of Philosophy of Colour, which came out last year, and my outreach websites, the Dimensions of Colour on Modern Colour Theory for Painters, and Colour Online a listing of selected internet links on colour. I teach an online short course on colour for painters through the National Art School in Sydney and practical classes at the National Art School, the Julian Ashton Art School and the University of Technology Sydney. My subject this morning is four aspects of colour that I think are quite fundamental but often misunderstood. I'll go through these relatively quickly today, but I'll link to some other videos I've made that go through these points in a more expanded form. The first thing I'd like to discuss is the question, what is a colour? When I perceive a light or an object to be red or white or green, I have the impression that this colour is a property of the light or object, and I might be inclined to assume that the colour is a physical property that my visual system simply detects. But the scientific consensus is that this is not so. This scientific consensus is often expressed in the form, colours do not exist. But the way I like to put it is that the colour that I see a light or an object as having is not a physical property, it is the way in which I perceive a physical property, subject to both the observer and the viewing conditions. This view of colour began in substantial detail with Sir Isaac Newton's research into the physical basis of colour. Through much of his writings, Newton speaks of the rays of light as being coloured, or indeed as being colours, but in his optics first published in 1704, he states that, for the rays to speak properly are not coloured. In them, there is nothing else than a certain power and disposition to stir up a sensation of this or that colour. Now, Newton wasn't the first person to hold similar views to this, but he added strong supporting evidence by showing that the colour of an isolated light could be predicted from the overall balance in a circular diagram of its spectral components. So the different small circles labelled with the letters P, Q, R and so on here represent, in Newton's terms, unequal numbers of rays from each sector having their common centre of gravity at point Z. Newton found that the direction of imbalance in the circle of this common centre of gravity towards Y here determines the hue of the light, such as red or green, or in this case orange, and the amount of imbalance, the distance OZ here, is proportional to, in Newton's terms, the fullness or intenseness of the colour, that is, its distance from whiteness. We now call this purity of colour of a light saturation. The crucial point here is that the whitish orange as a colour of light is the way in which we perceive a moderate imbalance among the light's component wavelengths towards a certain part of the spectrum. Although this whitish orange colour seems to us to be a property residing in the light, it exists in the light only as the power and disposition of this balance of spectral components to evoke this perception in the observer. Spectral orange is the way in which we perceive the greatest imbalance possible in a particular direction. Tempting though it is to think or say so, there is no reason to suppose that the spectral orange colour in our perception is also located in the wavelength of light itself, or is located anywhere when a mixture of this wavelength with other wavelengths evokes a different colour perception. When the wavelengths of the spectrum are present in a similar balance to daylight, their common centre of gravity is at the centre of the circle and the light lacks hue and saturation, appearing white or achromatic. To speak properly, such a light does not contain all the hues of the spectrum, as my multicoloured spectral distribution diagram here rather misleadingly suggests. It contains the wavelengths that when viewed in isolation are disposed to evoke these hue perceptions, but when combined in this balance have a disposition to evoke no hue. 
Newton's center of gravity principle implies that most colors of light can be evoked by many different combinations of wavelengths having the same center of gravity. These white lights on the right all appear the same because they have the same overall balance of wavelengths through the spectrum. A color perception tells us nothing about the specific wavelengths present in a light, only the overall balance of its spectral distribution. So the color of a light is related to its spectral composition. But this last rider is also important, subject to both the state of the observer and the viewing conditions. I'd like you to look at this rectangle and concentrate first on the vertical and then on the horizontal elements. What I'm hoping you'll see is that when you alternate between concentrating on these elements, when you concentrate on the vertical elements, you'll mainly see vertical red and green bands. But when you concentrate on the horizontal elements, you might see a predominance of horizontal purplish and olive bands. So the same pixels appear different colors depending on the viewer's attitude. Now I'd like you to keep your eyes fixed as much as possible on the black dot. If you can keep your eyes um, still enough, you might notice that all the colors begin to fade towards a middle gray as your eyes become adapted to the light from the screen. In any case, if you've been staring at that black dot, then when I switch to a white screen, you'll see faintly colored after images. And you might find that you can switch between seeing different after image colors when you switch between thinking of the vertical and horizontal elements. When we see colored after images, we have a perception of a spectral imbalance that does not exist physically in the stimulus related to ultimately prior adaptation of the visual system. As we continue to stare, those after image colors fade and we start to see the physical uniform rectangle as having a uniform white color. But if you were to take your laptop outside into bright sunlight, that same rectangle would appear quite a dark gray. And if you were to take it into a candlelit room, the same rectangle might look distinctly bluish. So the same physical stimulus can evoke different perceived colors depending on the observer, even just the mental attitude of the observer and the environment. Now, if the perceived color of a given stimulus can vary dramatically depending on the state of the observer and the viewing conditions, how can we then claim to measure the color of anything? When we do so, we're using the word color in a specific sense called psychophysical color that's based on color matching. Lights with physically different spectral distributions but having the same overall balance of wavelengths so that they match to a mathematically defined standard human observer when viewed in the same setting will have the same psychophysical specification and be represented by the same point in a chromaticity diagram such as Newton's circle or the CIE 1931 XY diagram in the middle here. For these matching evenly balanced spectral distributions on the right, this perceived color would be warm white when the lights are viewed in isolation, but could be other colors in other settings. We now understand that Newton's system is two dimensional because it's the product of a visual system involving three visual receptors. And such a system can detect a circuit of directions of imbalance towards long, middle, short, or long and short wavelengths. So my second point is that hue is the way in which we perceive this direction of imbalance. This can be demonstrated very nicely on a computer screen, which not coincidentally is a device for generating light with different balances of long, middle and short wavelength components. So we can just go around and vary the amounts of those three components. Think of this not as mixing the colors red, green and blue, but just mixing long, middle and short wavelength light. So when we've got a predominance of long wavelength light, we have a perception of red. When we have a 
mixture of long and middle wavelength light, reducing the average wavelength, we have a perception of yellow, and so on. A predominance of middle wavelengths is perceived as green, a pre predominance of short wavelengths is perceived as blue, a predominance of short and long wavelengths is perceived as magenta, and so back to red. Now this sort of diagram of course is familiar and it's usually presented as so-called additive mixing of the colours red, green and blue. But the idea of colour mixing seems to work in places, but not always. For example, when we mix a green light and a blue light, we get a turquoisey coloured digital cyan, which is both bluish and greenish. And when we mix a red and a blue light, we get a magenta colour that looks both reddish and bluish, so that works as well. But if we mix the red and green lights, we get a mixture that is neither reddish nor greenish, but just yellow. And this is a very good way to introduce the concept of the four unique hues, the four hues that we describe other colours in terms of. We seem to be able to experience red, green, yellow and blue as pure, and we tend to automatically describe other colours as combinations of these. This concept of unique hues is written into the CIE standard definition of hue, an attribute of a visual perception according to which an area appears similar to one of the colours red, yellow, green and blue, or a combination of adjacent pairs. It also appears outside the CIE system in the Scandinavian Natural Colour System, or NCS. For objects, we see the same circuit of directions of imbalance in their spectral reflectance, the wavelengths that they're disposed to reflect. So red as an object colour is the way in which we perceive an imbalance towards long wavelength reflectance. Bright yellow objects strongly reflect long and middle wavelengths and so on. So there's a circuit of directions of imbalance or bias that corresponds to the circuit of perception of hues. There's something I don't like about the way colour vision is often explained, which is that people often say that we have three cone cell types that detect red, green and blue wavelengths. You can see that they've even coloured the cone cells here, red, green and blue. The problem with that is that it tends to create a series of misconceptions. It doesn't dislodge the idea that the wavelengths themselves are coloured, and worse still, it leads people to jump to the conclusion that, quote, we only really see three colours. The idea is that red, green and blue are out there in the world and our visual system directly detects these colours and somehow makes up the other colours from combinations of these three colour signals. But if you look at those curves on the left, you'll see that the so-called long wavelength or red cone responds to all wavelengths of light and peaks in the middle of the spectrum that we see as yellow-green. The M cone, or so-called green cone, responds to almost all wavelengths of light, and neither of these can tell what wavelength of light hit it. They just respond more strongly to the wavelength near the peak. Then the S cone responds mainly to the shorter wavelengths that we see as violet and blue. The cone cells are connected up by cells that facilitate a process called cone opponency, in which the responses of the cone cells are compared with each other. According to this widely accepted model, some of these cells compare the S cone response to the L and M cone responses, and that creates a signal. And then other ones compare the L and the M cone responses with each other, and that creates another signal. So the cone cells still don't detect individual wavelengths, but the system as a whole responds to variations in the overall balance of energy among the long, middle and short wavelengths. So a red light from our screen creates a certain combination of those cone opponent signals, a green light a different combination, and a blue light a different combination. And if we vary the amounts of those lights, we can evoke a wide range of cone opponent signals that we ultimately perceive as a wide range of colours.
And if we get the balance of those lights just right, we can get zero on both cone opponent signals and might experience this in isolation as white light. The third point I'd like to raise is that it's important to understand that we can't really mix colors. That's not to say that we can't allow ourselves to sometimes speak as if we can, but it's important that we understand that colors are perceptions in our minds and are not located in the lights and the paints or the inks that we're mixing. If we mix, say, deep blue and yellow lights, we get white light. If we mix lights of these colors by interspersing them or by having a yellow and a blue disc spinning very quickly, we're going to see gray. And if we mix uh, paints of these colors, we're likely to see a moderately strong green result. This only seems anomalous if we think that we're mixing the colors yellow and blue, but we're not. These are just three different physical processes that have different physical results, and we just have different perceptions of those results. When we mix yellow and blue paints, we generally get a green mixture, and this is easy to understand if we know what's going on spectrally. Bright yellow is the way in which we perceive a spectral reflectance that's high in the long and middle wavelengths and low in the short wavelengths. And blue is the way in which we perceive a reflectance that's high in the short wavelengths. Paints of these colors, those curves generally have an overlap towards the middle of the spectrum, which means that the physical mixture of those paints results by subtractive mixing in an imbalance towards the middle of the spectrum that we perceive as green. So we can have two paints that don't look at all greenish. We can have a yellow that's not at all greenish and a blue that's not at all greenish that mix to make a moderately greenish paint. But if we don't understand all that and assume that the colors yellow and blue reside and mix in the paints, we can be forgiven for thinking that the color green must be made of yellow and blue. I think that this misconception is the basis of some peculiarities of the traditional color wheel. The colors that painters tend to call middle yellow, middle green, middle blue, and middle red are shown here on a Munsell hue scale. A Munsell hue scale is based on perceptually even spacing, but is also very close to showing additive complementaries. Additive complementaries, sometimes also called visual complementaries to distinguish them from paint mixing complementaries, are, colors, are the colors evoked by pairs of lights that have an opposite direction of spectral imbalance, such that when you mix them together, you get white light. The complementary pairs from the Munsell hue scale are red versus blue-green, yellow versus middle blue, green versus magenta, and cyan blue or B opposite orange YR. In the traditional color wheel, the color green is assumed to be made of yellow and blue. And so only the remaining three unique hues, red, yellow, and blue are regarded as primary colors. So what's going to happen if you arrange those middle red, middle yellow, and middle blue colors evenly around a circle? Well, two things are going to happen. You're going to stretch out that section between yellow and red. And you can see in the traditional color wheel on the left here, how the hue steps are really very small going through those orangey colors between yellow and red. But the same distance, we go through much bigger color differences between yellow and blue. So perceptually, it's a very uneven color wheel. The other thing is that it changes the opposite hue pairs. So green ends up being opposite red instead of green being opposite magenta and red opposite blue-green. Many of my students have told me that they've used this color wheel for years without checking the complementary relationship shown. I'd like you to fix your eyes on the black dot between Itten's red and green for about 10 seconds and keep them fixed there when I change the slide. <laughs> 
If you expected the colours to just swap places, you may be surprised to see the after image of the red as being a blue, green or turquoise colour, and the after image of the green as being magenta, essentially as expected from the additive complementaries. Now, after image colours can be offset somewhat from the precise additive complementary, but Itten's red and green are neither additive nor after image complementaries. My fourth point has two parts. The first part is relatively widely understood, that just three attributes such as hue, lightness and chroma are needed to describe colours of objects, including artists' paints. Sometimes colour instruction texts treat the colour wheel and the value scale only as separate things, but it's very useful to us as painters to think of these dimensions as combining to form a three-dimensional tree-like space as they do in the Mansell system, to understand that the colours of our paints occupy an irregular volume within this three-dimensional space, and to think of paint mixing as following paths through this space. For simplicity, colour instruction sometimes shows hue, lightness, chroma space as a simple sphere, but this inevitably involves serious distortions of the lightness and chroma scales. I've yet to see a painting student who needed to be shown a simple sphere before they could understand the concept of a Munsell colour tree, and the variations in the shapes of the hue pages are a vital part of the concept for painters. I'm just going to click through these next teaching slides as examples of how it's useful to think of paint mixing as following paths through a three-dimensional space. If you're interested, you'll find some of these examples on my website. But what's happening when we perceive an object as having a colour called an object colour? The perception of object colours is not directly related to the visual stimulus reaching the eye or the response of the cone cells. A bluish patch of the visual field can be seen as a blue object in white light or it can be seen as a white object in blue light. And the same object colour, for example white here, can be perceived in patches of the visual field sending very different light to the eye. Our ability to see objects as having hue, lightness and chroma is totally dependent on our ability to separate the effect of illumination from the properties of the object. So in the rectangle on the left, if you imagine that you're looking at an actual scene, you have a perception of a checkerboard pattern of mostly black and white squares and one blue square, but in the same rectangle, we have a perception also of varying illumination. So what we're seeing there are two superimposed perceptions. It's like we're seeing the object color through the illumination, or perhaps the illumination through the object color. Either way, we've definitely got two different perceptions superimposed in the same rectangle. Here's another example. Here we have a perception of black and white squares and a uniformly orange cube, but we also have in the same rectangle a perception of a pattern of illumination, a pattern of shadow areas and different amounts of light, and once again, these two perceptions are superimposed. We automatically and instantly and seemingly effortlessly parse the scene, that is, separate it into the effect of illumination and object colour. In addition, we have a third perception superimposed in the same rectangle. If we look at the orange cube, we see a colourful and brighter light coming from the top plane. We see a much dimmer and less colourful light coming to the eye from the plane on the left and something in between from the plane on the right. These are not different object colours, these are different colours of light reaching our eye. This is why hue, lightness and chroma are not enough to describe the colour appearance of an illuminated scene. 
They're enough to describe colours of objects, but to fully describe the appearance of an illuminated scene, we need additional attributes. So in this picture, on the left here, we see the red stripe as having the same colour, that is, as not changing its colour between light and shadow. And we would expect uh, both areas to match the same Munsell chip placed beside them in the shadow and in the light. But nevertheless, we see that the top area looks brighter and more colourful. So these CIE terms, brightness and colourfulness, mean just what you'd expect them to mean in ordinary language. They refer to the appearance of the light reaching our eye from different areas of the object. There's another useful attribute in CIE terminology called saturation, defined as the colourfulness of an area judged in proportion to its brightness. As we go from the bottom to the top area, the light coming to your eye becomes more colourful, but also brighter. And it could be said that the colourfulness is increased in step with the brightness. This in effect means that the light hasn't become either more or less whitish. I see this light as red with a quite small white component. And saturation refers to this proportion of white and coloured components in the appearance of the light that remains about the same. So with our orange cube, you can see that the colourfulness increases in step with the brightness. So we have a straight line relationship between the two, which is a line of uniform saturation. In simple lighting situations, this is what we see. And this is very important to us as painters as well, because if we're going to paint that object, we're going to translate the brightness and the colourfulness of the light coming from the object into the lightness and chroma of our paints. And so we'll be using a series of paints following lines like this, radiating from near the black point. There's a slight complication there that I won't go into now. There's one more attribute that's not in the CIE system yet, but is used in some other systems like the Scandinavian natural color system, the concept of blackness and its inverse, which is called brilliance. These dimensions describe what happens to the colors as we move along these red lines. We start with black, followed by colors with a high black content or blackness, then decreasing blackness or perceived black content, eventually up to a point of zero blackness. And you can imagine if we continued, what would happen if we kept getting brighter, but kept the hue and saturation the same? We'd get colors that look fluorescent and eventually colors that look self-luminous. So the attribute of blackness is built into the NCS system and it's a useful alternative way of describing uh, object color relationships. So yes, three attributes are enough for many purposes for describing colors of objects, but we need more than three to describe the color appearance of an illuminated scene, to describe colors of lights, and to highlight different relationships among object color perceptions. So, I know I've covered a lot of ground in this talk, but if you want to read more about these aspects of colour, here are some resources that you could look at. A lot of this came out of being invited to write a chapter on colour spaces for the Routledge Handbook of Philosophy of Colour uh, in 2016 by Derek Brown, who we had yesterday, and Fiona McPherson. Uh, I think since then I've thought of some better ways of explaining some of these things, and these appear in a couple of videos, what is a colour and hue and its components that I've got up on YouTube. Uh, the part about the basis of the traditional colour wheel is from my presentation for the Munsell Centennial Symposium in Boston in 2018, and is available on the ISCC website. Um, and other aspects of this are covered in my website, uh, The Dimensions of Colour.
All right, so that's it, and thank you very much.